Amen. Uh, so glad tonight that we have one of my, matter of fact, my dearest son in the faith. Um, Pastor Chris Lewis is with us, and he's going to minister the Word of God to us. He has planted a church in Atlanta, moved to Atlanta, disobeyed God, didn't stay with us, moved to Atlanta, just, and uh, he's doing great over there, and he's going to minister to you a phenomenal word, and also tell you how he lost like 100 pounds and now looks thinner than me, and I'm a little upset about that, I got to be honest with you, but would you welcome Pastor Chris Lewis as he comes? Amen. Are you guys glad to be in the house? Praise the Lord. They changed everything up on me when I came into the service tonight. Usually Pastor Frank would be over there, and he switched it up, and now he's sitting over here. They changed the pulpit, and it's shorter, and uh, but everything's good. Praise the Lord. I, I, y'all are still standing. I'm not used to that. Our church, as soon as I get up the microphone, my church like sits down. So am I supposed to do something? Just tell them to sit down? Y'all can sit down and have a seat. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house. And uh, I wore my, my 4th of July garb. I got red, white, and blue. My shoes are blue, if you can't tell. Got my blue suede Elvis shoes on and my red pants. And Pastor Frank, he, he, like, he posts pictures on Facebook like, should I wear this shirt? Should I wear this shirt? So I said, you know what? I'm going to wear a shirt on Saturday night service, and it's going to be awesome. I'm not supposed to say that word, Saturday or night, but I just did. Praise the Lord. Um, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to John chapter 4? And uh, as you're turning there, I want to share a few things with you. A lot of you have no idea who I am. I grew up in this church. This is my home church. And uh, we were the, my wife and I were the New York City campus pastors when we first started New York City. And Pastor Ron has done a fantastic job. And I'm a little bit jealous now that they're doing every tribe church. I'm kind of like, I kind of want to be back just a little bit. Like, like, you know what? Y'all can have Atlanta. I'm coming back to help out. Like, that's how awesome and excited I am about every tribe church. Are y'all excited for that? Y'all can tell I've been living in the, in the South because I say y'all like every other word now. Not use guys anymore. It's, it's y'all. So we, we, um, after we left Connecticut, we, we had a short time in Texas. We pastored a church in Texas, and, and we really felt the Lord was calling us out. Some of you know our story. And um, we, we left Texas just in time for the Lord to speak to us to move to Georgia to start a church just for COVID to come about. And, and everybody's story is very similar. COVID happened, and it was crazy, and it was ridiculous. And, and the Lord's like, you got to move, and you got to do it. And, and uh, so we had our first meeting was March 15th of 2020. Well, if, 13th. If y'all know that date, if you know that date, I'm going to try to stop saying y'all, but if you know that date, it was the day that COVID came out to the world that you couldn't have more than 50 people in a room. And then three days later, you couldn't have more than 10 people in a room. I'm like, God, what are you doing? We moved from our house in Texas. We planted a church. We're starting to do something. And then church got shut down. So we kind of put some things on pause. And April this past year, we, we launched Legacy Church in the Atlanta area, right outside of Atlanta in a town called Covington, Georgia. And we prayed, and, and, and I need to share this with you because it's vitally important with what God has called us to do and who you sit under. And if you don't know this already, Pastor Frank and Lisa are the best pastors on the planet. How many believe that? Amen. And I've been to Bible college and I've seen great preachers preach, but I can tell you right now that he is the best pastor and my favorite preacher on the planet. And when I get to tonight's message or today's message, you might have heard this once before because I think I stole it from him a couple of years ago, but I switched it up just a little bit so it's not exactly the same, but maybe close enough. But we moved... We moved to, to Georgia, and we wanted to plant a church, and, and, and I told the Lord no. I told the Lord no because I didn't want to plant a church. I knew the struggles that come with it. I know that you're, you're setting up and tearing down, and I was like, I'm done with that lifestyle. I'm not doing that anymore, but the Lord said do it, so we did it. And he brought us to this town called Covington, Georgia. And we, my wife and I specifically prayed for a, a, an opportunity that we can break the back of the enemy with this race junk that's going on. And we, we, he brought us to a city that's pretty much 50% white and 50% black, and it's awesome. And so here's the thing, is that when you start to find out all the different stuff about the town that we're in, the town is where uh, uh, the Dukes of Hazard was shot, it's where the heat of the night was shot, the movie and the show, it's where Gone with the Wind was shot, it's where the Vampire Diaries are shot. It's where this show on Netflix called uh, Sweet Magnolia is shot. 
and all these different uh, videos and movies and TV shows are shot in this town, but there's a racial divide in this town, and there's a demonic presence in this town that God had called us to break, not just me and my wife specifically, but the Lord and the anointing that God has given us under Pastor Frank, and he's my pastor. And if you don't know this, he will always be my pastor, and I'd come, for him, come to him for spiritual advice. I said, Pastor, should we do this? He's like, go for it. And so we planted this church. And so can I tell you right now, like, like y'all got a, an amazing worship team, like Maverick City. Who is Maverick City, right? And if y'all, if y'all don't know who Maverick City is, y'all been living under a rock for like a year. But they got nothing compared to faith worship. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all need to clap a little bit better than that. I'm about to get to my message in just a second. But we planted this church, and, and God was doing some great things, and, and we specifically sought out different people, different talents, different tribes to be a part of our church. A whole worship team is black. We have nobody white on our worship team other than my wife when she sings. Now, why is that important? Why do I tell you that? Not because I'm trying to tell you that I'm pastoring black people or anything like that, but because it's important that we come together and we recognize that black people or white people or Hispanic people are not the enemy, that they are not just because somebody might have a different political persuasion than you is not the enemy, that they are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need to stop that junk, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? Amen? And so we had, and I, I'm, I'm getting to the point that I really want to get to. And so we have a young couple in our church. We actually have two of them. We have a, a mixed couple in our church, and I know that's nothing new for this church, but for our church, it was brand new, and for that area, it's new. Young couple, uh, she's black and he's white, they went to a church a couple years ago. The husband had his arm around his wife. Guy, an usher came up to him and said, we don't do that here. He got up, took his wife, and left. He told me the other day, we had him over for dinner. He said, Pastor, your church is the first church that we feel comfortable in. Here's the reason why I shared all of that with you. is because there's an anointing. And I believe that there's an anointing on our pastor in this house to break that spirit. Amen? To break the spirit of division, to break the spirit of all this junk that we're going through that we see in America, that, that the enemy has tried to raise his head, but guess what we're gonna do is we're gonna stomp the enemy out in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. John chapter four, verses one through 26. And in all my years that I've preached here, I don't think I've ever preached in front of Pastor Frank. He's always usually gone. So I'm a little bit nervous because because like I, I got to, I, not that I'm nervous about preaching a bad message, but kind of like I want to make daddy proud a little bit. So John chapter four, verses one through 26 says this. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which was called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Joseph's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It is about the sixth hour. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? And you're great, are you greater than, your, than our father Jacob who gave the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom now you are, uh, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. And that you spoke truly, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive 
that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and the Jews say that, this, say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Verse 21. Then Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we ask that you would be with us. We ask that you would touch each each and every person in service today. God, I ask right now in the mighty name of Jesus that people would be delivered and healed and set free, Father God. Father, I thank you that we would come into a revelation that you are the Christ and that you are the Messiah. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Have you ever been thirsty before? Raise your hand if you've ever been thirsty before. Have you ever run a marathon before and all you wanted to do was get something to drink? Anybody ever run a marathon? Only only one people that have, I have not lost this weight by by running marathons, I'll be honest with you. Just kind of eating right and a little bit of exercise will, will change your life forever. The Sahara Desert is the largest desert in the world, filling much of North Africa. It's nearly 3 million square miles. It's huge. It's massive. And if you wanted something to drink in the Sahara Desert, you would have to go mile upon mile upon mile upon mile. And the nomadic people that are living there are continuously moving to try to find water and try to find uh, food in places that they can have better living, con- living conditions. But did you know that in modern technology that they've discovered that there's actually large underground lakes underneath the Sahara Desert. Now, I want you to think about that story and think about your own personal life. Have you ever been thirsty? Have you ever gone from one place to another place to another place to try to find something to drink? Have you ever gone to the gas station and they didn't have what you wanted, so you went to the next gas station, and they didn't have what you wanted there, so you went to the next gas station, and finally you got something to drink? Or they didn't have what you wanted, and so you just went for something that was easy even though it wasn't what you wanted? Does that ring true for anybody in the room? I know y'all are lying because I've done that multiple, multiple times. You see, many times we find ourselves in a place that we're thirsty, Thirsty for water, or we're thirsty for a drink, or we're thirsty for an opportunity, or we're thirsty for a new job, or we're thirsty for a new car, or a new house, or we're thirsty for a relationship. There used to be a saying, and I might date myself because this was kind of a cool thing like a couple of years ago. And when you got teenagers, like the sayings change constantly, like all the time. How many got teenagers in the house? Raise your hand if you got teenagers. Teenagers are crazy. I'm just going to tell you right now, I got two of them. Pray for me. They wanted to be here so badly. Our flight, we were supposed to fly in Thursday. Our flight got canceled. We were at the airport for 15 hours. And I started praying. I was like, God, you need to do something. And so we were there for 15 hours, and they did something. They canceled the flight. So they weren't able to come. And uh, so I caught a flight uh, this morning, and, and we got, or I got out here. But I'm just glad to be here this I was going to say this morning. I'm glad to be here today. But there used to be a saying that if a woman wanted a relationship bad enough, they would say that she's thirsty. How many have ever heard that before? She thirsty. She's just trying to get any kind of man. She, she thirsty. She don't even care if he's if he good looking, if he got money. She's just so thirsty. She's willing to, to settle for, for Billy Bob, and he ain't even got any teeth. I mean, she's thirsty. Now, I don't know if they say that about men, but, but men, sometimes you're thirsty too, and you're just willing to settle for anything that comes your way. She looked at me. My God, she must want me. You're thirsty. It's not good to be that kind of thirsty. But could you imagine the kind of thirst that we get, that we could have spiritual living water so close to us that it's sitting on our our bookshelves that all we've got to do is grab it and we would never thirst again, but yet we refuse to grab what will constantly keep us quenched. Talking about the word of God. 
How many have a Bible in your house? Raise your hand if you got a Bible in your house. You got a Bible on your phone. You're thirsty. You're thirsty for something. I can tell you how thirsty you are if you open up your apps and you press the, the button, the gear button, and you find out all the different apps you use, and you would find on Facebook you've spent four hours, but your Bible app has spent zero minutes. You're thirsty, but you're drinking from the wrong well. So the first thing that I want to share with you is this, is that we as people, I believe that we are thirsty for righteousness. You see, the well that we drink from is the thing where we find our strength in. And if you're drinking from the wrong well, you will find that you have either no strength or you've got amazing strength. You see, what is the well that you're drinking from? Is the well that you're drinking from performance? Is it politics? Is it social platforms? Is it social media? Is it sports? Is it entertainment? Is it family? None of those things in by themselves are evil. But if we're constantly going to those wells before we go to the well of God, we're missing out on what God has for us. What well are you drinking from? I believe that most people want to do right. But they get their definition of right by the well that they drink in. What well are you drinking from? Because I can honestly tell you that politics is not a good well to drink from. I can honestly tell you that even though I love sports, you know what's so crazy? I saw a Mets fan walk into Starbucks today with a Yankee shirt on. I was like, praise the Lord. God is coming back. This is awesome. I don't think the Yankees won today. But anyways, I just thought that was cool. I won't say who it was because it was someone that everybody knows in the room. But, but anyways, we're going we to we'll just keep going from there. But I was like, man, get, revival is about to happen. A Mets fan is wearing a Yankees jersey. Praise God. But here's the thing. What well are you drinking from? You see, you get your ideals and you get your, your, your righteousness from the well that you drink from. And if you're drinking from the wrong well, you're going to get poison on the inside of you. Now, I live in the country. And if, if I were to tell you my address right now, you would Google it and you would find it. But I've got about 300 acres around my house. I live in the middle of nowhere and I love it. It's awesome. I've got 150 acres over here. I got 100 and something acres over here. Now, I wish they were all mine. All I have is one little acre, but everybody else has got all these acres around me, and I just pretend that it's mine. I go out there, and I'm like, oh, there's a deer over there. There's a turkey over there. And my son, since we started living in the South, my son, like, he's all country. Like, he lost all of his New York City swag. He lost all, he's got country boots. And I'm like, I'm like, you really want to wear those? He's like, yeah, Dad. And he's listening to, to country music. And I'm like, all right, that's cool, whatever you want. But, but he's like, Dad, can we go? shoot some turkeys today. And I went hunting. I went hunting for the first time in my life. See, Pastor Frank, he prophesied. I say, I got to pick on Pastor Frank a little bit. He prophesied over my life when I was a teenager. He called me big country all the time. And now I am living in the big country. Anyways, what well are you drinking from? I lost where I was going with my story of my son. That's okay. It might come back to me. What well are you drinking from? And this woman, she goes to the well, but here's the thing. Oh, that's where I was going. I've got a well at my house. I live in the country and I've got a well at my house. We don't have uh, city water. We've got well water and our well is 200 feet down. And they say that you've got to drill so many feet down to get the natural water to come up. And it's excellent water. Has anybody ever drank water from well water? It's, it's pure, it's clean, it's awesome, it's refreshing. And here's the thing, is that Jesus' well is so clean and so pure and so deep that it goes all the way down that he's got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And when you drink from his well, you're free. And when you're free, you're not just free a little bit, but you're free indeed. Now here's the thing, Matthew chapter six. This is what ends up happening when we drink from the wrong well. Matthew chapter six, one through four. It says, be especially careful when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be, a, it might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself You've seen them in action, I'm sure, placators. I call them treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage, acting compassionate as, as long as someone is watching, playing to the crowds. They get applause. True, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just 
do it. You see Nike, you thought Nike was the one that came up with that, but the Bible came up with that. Just do it. Quietly and unobtrusively, that is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. I remember a, I remember a couple years ago, Pastor Frank and I were in, I didn't know he was going to be in here, and I had all these stories planned before I thought that he was going to be in the service, so y'all are thinking I'm fanboying about Pastor Frank, I'm really not. But I remember, I remember we were in New York City, and it's right when we planted the New York City campus, and and, and we're, we're, we're walking down the street, and this guy had a minivan, and he had a bunch of, I think it was rolls of carpet that fell out of the back of his minivan. And I was ready just to keep walking. But Pastor Frank's like, no, 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 we gotta stop him, we've gotta help him. And here's the thing. He didn't try to give him a card and try to get him to come to church. He just said, God bless you, and we went on our way. Here's the thing that we've got to do is we've got to drink from the right well. And when we do things for God, we don't do it for our kingdom. We do it for his kingdom. And when we do something for God, we don't try to get the glory for it. We give God the glory for it. You see, what we do is we drink from the wells of all these different things. Well, I'm socially active over here, and I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm serving over here. And what we do is we put ourselves out there thinking that we're all that in a bag of chips. But we found, or what we find is that we drink from the wrong well. The scripture tells us that we get applause by doing these things. But let me ask you this question. Did you know that you can drink from the wrong, the wrong well constantly and you will, you will create a habit in your life that teaches you that your thirst has been quenched? You can go to a, a bar, and I'm not telling you to go to a bar, but you can go to a bar, and they give you pretzels, and they give you chips, and they give you salty things, and why do they do that? It's because it takes your brain, does two things. It makes you want to drink, and then it drinks, you drink something that's got salt in it, and then you drink more things and eat more things, and so that you become thirstier and thirstier and thirstier, but what you go back for is not something that quenches your thirst. And so we find ourselves going back to all these different wells that never quench our thirst. But Jesus says, if you drink from my well, you will never thirst again. This woman comes, she comes about the sixth hour, which is about the noonday, and she comes because she's embarrassed, she's, she's ashamed of her life. She doesn't just have one husband or two husbands or three husbands or four husbands. She's now had five husbands, and the man that she's living with is no longer or not even her husband. And so she comes because she's got to get something to drink and she's got to get some water for herself. And she goes to the well when nobody else is there. Sure enough, there's Jesus, the Messiah. But Jesus doesn't ridicule her or condemn her. Jesus simply directs her to the place that she needs to be. She's found that what she's tried to do is she's tried to quench her thirst in serial human relationships instead of a relationship with God. And so what she's done, she's settled for stagnant water. I want to encourage you not to settle for stagnant water, something that you can just grab real easily. You know, have you ever looked at the bottle of a Dasani water bottle before? Did you know that they put salt in Dasani water to make you thirstier so that you'd go back and get another bottle of water? You see, we have to know what we're drinking from. Don't settle for something that's stagnant or something that's easy. Settle for something that, you know what, it might cost me something. I've got to go somewhere. It costs somebody something. It costs my Savior. And he dug a well that's so deep that I will never thirst again. I find it amazing that the church is the, the people that should have all the answers, but yet we're the ones that fall into the enemy's traps like nobody's business. Did you know that more marriages today, it is a proven fact that church marriages are the worst marriages on the planet? That more marriages in the church end up in divorce than the world does. One, because the world isn't probably getting married. And number two, is that we have settled for stagnant water. Adults are leaving churches like never before. There's pornography rampant in, in, in church like never before. And we're the ones that are supposed to have the answers in the relationship with Christ. But what we've done is we've made church the well instead of Jesus the well. And I applaud everybody that served this weekend and this week because that's amazing and that's awesome and we should do that. But what we've done is we made serving the well instead of serving Jesus We've made, well, I've done this and I've done that. You know what? I was there till two o'clock in the morning. Where were you? 
Where, where were you when, when I was sitting up and tearing up? Where were you? And what we've done is we made serving the well instead of serving Jesus. Number two is this, is that this woman, she's thirsty, but she's thirsty for true relation. Excuse me, she's thirsty for true worship. Check this out. John chapter four, verse 23 says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 says this, do you not see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent, an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he won't quit until all is cleansed. God himself is a fire. We've got to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I love what that scripture says. It says that we have an unshakable kingdom when we worship at the well of Jesus. When we worship at the well of Jesus, we now put something on the inside of us that becomes unshakable. You see, when we drink from the right well, we can't be stopped. We are an immovable force. We are a kingdom that can't be defeated. How many want to drink from that well that you can't be defeated? That when your enemy tries to come your way, you can't be shaken. You see, if we drink from the wrong well, but if we drink from the right well, we're unshakable. You see, we worship in spirit and in truth. What is spirit? Spirit is the person of Jesus Christ. And we have, this happens all the time. Just like, you know, we, we compare with, you know, I was serving and I was doing this and I did all these things. But what we do is that, how many have ever been to a church that, that wasn't your home church before? You went to somebody else's church. You've been invited to somebody else's church before. And they, they dressed a little different than you dress. Like they dressed up. How many have ever been to a church they, the ladies wear hats? How many have ever been to a Baptist church? Raise your hand if you've been to a Baptist church. How many have ever been to a Pentecostal church? How many have ever been to a Lutheran church? How many have ever been to a Catholic church? Raise your hand. How many have never been to church? See, if you raise your hand, you're lying because you're in church right now. You see, we go to different churches, and what we do is we say this, is we say, oh, well, they don't pray in tongues. Ah, they don't allow the Holy Spirit to move. Ah, they, they, they're socially active in their community. That's not the kind of church that, that I want to be involved in. Ah, they got black people. They got Hispanic people. They got white people. You see, I've been in black churches. I've been in Pentecostal churches. I've been in white churches. I've been in Lutheran churches. And I don't allow the things that they do or don't do to stop me from worshiping. And we've got to get to the place where we don't allow those things to happen. You see, we have to worship in spirit and in truth. We've got to worship the, per worship the person of Jesus Christ. I'm not so much concerned whether you pray in tongues or don't pray in tongues. Do you know Jesus? Even though I would love for you to, I'm not so much concerned if, if you are politically involved or not, but do you worship Jesus? You know, I, I'm not so much concerned whether or not you're going to jump and shout or you're going to be sitting there with your arms folded. I'm not so much concerned whether you're going to raise your hand or not, but are you worshiping Jesus? What well are you at? Do you worship him in spirit or do you worship him in your flesh? You see, she needs to worship. She's thirsty for true worship. Worshiping in spirit and in truth. What is truth is the revelation of Jesus Christ discovering what Jesus is and who Jesus is by the Bible's standards and not by the world's standards. Because you can listen to news all day long and they can tell you that Jesus sinned, but in the reality, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus never sinned. He was a sinless man that walked on this earth that died on a cruel, rugged cross so that we could have salvation. You see, that is the truth. We get our truth from the Bible. We get our truth from the right well, not a wrong well, because the wrong well will give you poison. The wrong well will give you all these different things, and the wrong well will cause you to believe a lie. But are you drinking from the right well. 
I don't know if I'm drinking from the right well. I know that, that sometimes I feel depressed. I feel hurt. I feel, I feel confused. But, but Jesus tells us that we're loved, that he values us, that he wants us, that he wants to enable us to do great things, that he saves us. You see, the truth of the matter, the, the fact is, is that whatever God says, it is. What do you mean, pastor? You see, we have value because he says we have value. We are wanted because he says that we are wanted. We are enabled because he says that we are enabled. We have faith because he says that you can have faith. I saw a commercial just the other day. It might have been, it might have been an ad on social media. I can't remember. But it was a, it was a commercial, I think, for, for some makeup company. And this girl's putting on her makeup. And she, she was already attractive, but she puts her makeup on and she, she just looked absolutely gorgeous. And the tagline was, worship yourself. I feel like we have dug into that well. That we have gotten to the place where we worship ourselves. Self-worship. I don't want to drink from that well. I don't want to worship at that well because I know that I'm not that good. I know that my well can't go deep enough to to bring out salvation. I know that my well can't save me, that my well doesn't have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. But I know somebody's well who does, and his name is Jesus. Number three is this. She's thirsty for true relationship. She's thirsty for true relationship. John chapter four, verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. She knows that the Messiah is coming. She's been taught that the Messiah is coming. She's been taught that he will be the Christ. What is Christ? The anointed one and his anointing. She's been taught that. But she doesn't know that the Messiah and the Christ is standing in front of her. She doesn't realize and recognize that the one that is called to set her free, that the one that has the keys of death, hell, and the grave is standing right in front of her. But Jesus reveals himself to her. You see, she's thirsty. Have you ever been thirsty? Have you ever been so thirsty that you're willing to believe what anybody says, that they spew whatever they say and you believe it and it's stuck in your heart and you come to find out that that's not the truth? Me and and one of the pastors were having a discussion today and we were talking about fruit and we all know that tomato is not a vegetable, that tomato is a fruit. We all know that. But did you know that a cucumber is not a vegetable? It's a fruit. And when we come to find out the real truth, we're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. That's not what I've been taught. You see, anybody my age or older, you've been taught that Pluto's a planet, but we found out that it's not a planet. Now it's a dwarf planet. Some of you are like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about, Pastor? Pluto ain't a planet. Yeah, where have you been? It's been out for like 10 years. But when truth comes in your life or relationship starts to happen, and that's exactly what happens. Jesus is standing in front of her, and he says, I am the one that you're speaking about. She's saying, I'm thirsty for somebody who really knows me. I'm thirsty for somebody who really knows who I am. And Jesus knows everything about her before that he even met her. Why? Because he's the one that created her. He knows her ins and outs. He knows her faults, and he's her, all her failures. And she comes, and he says, you don't just have one husband, but you've had five, and the worst person that you're living with now is not even your husband. He doesn't condemn her. He lifts her up. He says, I am the one. I am the Christ that you've been taught about. I'm the Christ that you've been told about. I'm the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And he does something to her in her life that's so dramatic that changes everything about her. You remember when I told you that she came at noonday? about the sixth hour. She comes in the middle of the day because she's embarrassed, she's afraid, she's, she doesn't want to talk to people. She just wants to get her water and go back home. She's embarrassed that she's had so many different men in her life, that she's had one relationship after another relationship after another relationship. But check this out. John chapter four, verse 39. 
through 42, it says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many, uh, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. You see, this woman, she was embarrassed. She was embarrassed to talk to people, but now she's running back to the people that she was embarrassed of, that she was embarrassed by, the people that made fun of her, the people that ridiculed her, the people that said, ah, she's just, she's just a hussy. She just goes from one relationship to another relationship. She thinks that she, she's so thirsty. Man, my, I can't believe how thirsty she is. And she keeps going from one place and another man to another man to another man. And she don't care at this point. She comes running back to, to all the people in the village and she says, I met a man. And they're thinking, psh. Sure, you met a man. Susie, this is, like the, this is like, the, like the 10th man you met. What are you talking about? You met a man. We know you met a man. She goes, no, 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 no. I didn't just meet any man. I met a man who knows me intimately. I met a man who knows my, my faults and my failures. And I met a man who, who wants to save me and set me free. I met a man that I will drink from his water, that his well is so deep that he's going to save me and he's going to seal me in his redemptive love. You see, I met a man. My question is, what well are you drinking from? You might be thinking, I, I've been through some storms in life. I, I've been through some hard times in my life. But God is waiting for your story to come out of your storm so you can tell everybody else. See, this woman went through a storm and she tells her story. So you don't just tell anybody your story when you're embarrassed by it. But when your story gets to the place where you've got salvation, when your story gets to the place that it has come out of the storm and you've got a savior, you don't care what anybody says about you. You're willing to risk it all and that's what she does. And the people were amazed and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was just going to fill his water bucket but he ends up staying two extra days. Why? Because they believed. You see, your story is about to change somebody else's life. What well are you drinking from? She's thirsty for someone who really knows her. She's had one bad relationship after bad relationship after bad relationship. She's thirsty for someone who can really make himself known. Now, I haven't been in too many relationships, but I've been in enough relationships to know that when somebody doesn't want to tell you something, it's not a good relationship. When somebody hides things from you, it's not a good relationship. When somebody puts things off because they're embarrassed of you, it's not a good relationship. But Jesus makes himself known. It says in John chapter 4, verse 26, he says, I who speak to you, am he. She realized and recognized at that moment that this man was not like any other man that I've met. You see, he wants relationship with me. And just like that woman at the well, Jesus wants relationship with you. You see, who is he? He's the alpha and the Omega, he's the beginning and the end. He's the Rose of Sharon. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one who would take away the sins of the world. He's the one that would die for all humanity. Who is he? He is the peace when there is no peace. Who is he? He is absolute. Who is he? He is constant. Who is he? He is your healer. Who is he? He's your dream giver. Who is he? He's the door and the window opener. Who is he? He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah and what's he saying? He's saying you don't have to look any longer. You don't have to drink from that well any longer. Your wait is over. Your search is over and I'm the one that's about to quench your thirst. And what we've been searching for, we search for a dog. And we, and we try to hear what that bark, 
to try to get our attention. But can I tell you that Jesus is no dog and he does not bark, but he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And what do lions do? They roar. And when they say your, your hurt is over, he roars at your hurt. When he says your pain is over, he roars at your pain. When he says cancer is over, he roars at your cancer. When he says your children are coming back, he roars at your children. You see, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not like a lion. He is the lion. He is the one that will set you free and heal you. What well are you drinking from? You've been timid. You've been scared. Well, I, I've drank from this well. I drank from that well and I got hurt. I drank from that well and I got poisoned. I drank from, from that well and I, I, I was told this and I, I drank from that well, but you're telling me something different, Pastor. I am telling you something different. I'm telling you that you can live in peace. I'm telling you that you can have harmony with your brothers and sisters of different races and different cultures. I'm telling you that you can love a Democrat and a Republican. I'm telling you that you can love a liberal and that you can love a conservative. What am I telling you is that you don't have to believe the lie, the well that you've been drinking from. You don't need to drink from it any longer. It's about time that we let our buckets down and let Jesus fill your well. Now, it's weird to say this, and I know my pastor knows this, but pastor, you know what you're about to do with Hezekiah Walker is going to shake the world. I can't even tell you how excited I am about that vision, about that dream. We don't have to drink from that poison any longer. No one will ever love me. You don't have to drink from that poison any longer. It's about time you let your buckets it's about time you let your bucket down and let Jesus fill your bucket with hope, with healing, with forgiveness. Jesus wants to fill your bucket. He wants to be that friend that knows you so intimately that he doesn't care about, about all the things that you've done wrong, about all those past hurts and mistakes. He doesn't care about all that, what he's saying, he's saying, let down your bucket. You've been waiting for me your whole life. Let down your bucket. I'm about to heal you. Let down your bucket. I'm about to heal that scar that you've been hiding forever. But now that scar is about to be your story because you've come through the storm. Let down your bucket and watch me fill. Watch me fill it with living water water that will cause you to never thirst again. Let down your bucket. Would you stand to your feet? Thanks so much for watching. If this message encouraged you, be sure to join again at one of our many church online experiences live every weekend. Just click watch live in the description below. If you'd also like to learn more about getting involved here at Faith Church, click the connect button. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video. Maybe even share it with one of your friends. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, remember with Jesus, you are destined to win.